speak too much, please allow Elizabeth Olikowski to overshare. How are you doing, Elizabeth? I'm great, Nick. How are you? I'm good. What a tongue twister in the beginning, huh? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a long one. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, you have a lot of experience, which I'm super pumped on. Um, I love that you were able to make some time to speak with us today. So thank you very much for that. I wish we could do it in person, but uh, like everybody else, we're all working from home, right? How's your day been? Likewise. Uh, it's been good, just back to back, slammed with Zoom calls like I'm sure everyone else is. Yeah. Um, but I'm so grateful for the opportunity to um, not only do my first podcast episode, because this is it, um, but also do it with somebody that, you know, not only a friend, but somebody that is, you know, a fellow entrepreneur that I also look up to and am inspired by. So uh, thank, thank you. you for having me. I appreciate that a lot. Um, you know, what's awesome is we've, at, we've had a lot of time to kind of connect on a business level, not so much on a personal level. And I don't know if you know this, but I start every question with something kind of different. Uh, I'd love to know what you were like in high school. Um, so me in high school, I'm, I was a butterfly. So I was the I went to a pretty big high school, so I, I didn't have one clique that I, that I was friends with. It was kind of like I floated around and was friends with all the cliques, um, but I was an athlete, so I was, um, I played field hockey and lacrosse, and, um, and I worked, you know, starting my junior year, I worked pretty much, so, and that's when I realized I much prefer working over going to school. <laughs> nice. So were you, did you go to high school on the East Coast, or were you out here? Yeah, so I grew up in the Northeast. I grew up in New Jersey, um, like 15, 20 minutes east of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved to California 10, 10 years ago, actually, this past January. Um, but um, the high school I went to, I mean, it was pretty big. And it was like the, a hub from like all these different regions of towns that like, you know, just dumped to like one school, basically. Um, but. Were you an Eagles fan or a Giants fan? Eagles. I guess that's sure. perfect. That's fine. <laughs> There's been well, some... not, I mean, I've fallen off since I've moved. So I guess now I'm a Rams fan or a Chargers fan. I don't even know. I, 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 I like that. Keeping it local. That's fine. Yeah. Most yeah. of my families are, are is uh, they grew up on the East Coast too. So Giants fan by nature. I don't even really have a choice if I want to like be invited to any family functions. It's all Giants all the time. <laughs> It's intense. <laughs> right. How do, I mean, what was your, um, I know that you like went from circle to circle. And for some reason, when I talk to you, I get a great vibe of energy from you in that you're able to connect with multiple people um, on different levels, right? Whether it's on a fitness level, on a social level, but definitely on a business level. When did you start to when did you start to realize that like, hey, maybe this knack, this, this business aspect of my personality, I have a knack for that and I want to lean into that? So, you know, it's in my DNA. It's a hard question to answer because from a very young age, I mean, I converted my dad storage closet in the basement to my office and I literally posted my business hours on the outside of the door and I was probably 11 like I asked for cash registers for Christmas and my birthday presents like I was just like very much into starting something of my own from the very get-go like um my sisters and I laugh about it because we have this chore chart growing up and my mom you know put these you know a couple chores for each person on the list I have two sisters um and and we would get paid 50 cents per chore. Mm. And I wasn't old enough to have responsibility. So she, and, and where she wanted, didn't want me to do chores at that point. But I started asking my sisters if I could do their chores for them so I could take their allowance. And then my mom caught wind of it, like the politics that were going on with her kids. And I was getting paid 25 cents for doing their chores and they were pocketing the other 25 cents and they wouldn't, didn't have to do anything. Um, so, so from there, so that from sounds there, like, like, that sounds like the mob, first of all, <laughs> right? I know it, it, was, it was messed up, but, um, but from there, my mom added me to the chore chart and then basically she just gave me the price or like the, the value of doing certain chores. So every Saturday, pretty much every Saturday, I would wake up early and I'd spend the entire morning and afternoon cleaning the house from top to bottom. And I would just write on a little notepad and invoice her and just say, like, you owe me $20, basically. You were writing um, an invoice at 11 years old. Well, at that point, it was, it was all the way through my teens. So it was like, you know, I, I think I converted the office at 11, maybe, you know, and then I was added to the chore chart well before that, probably like 
I don't know, seven years old. But, um, but yeah, it's funny because I, like, I would <laughs> use that $20, which wasn't much, you know, but it was motivating enough for me to have something on my own. You know, my parents didn't, they taught us the value of working hard and that nothing's given to you. Um, and I just, you know, I just, it became part of me and it's in, it's in my DNA. But when I realized I really wanted to like actually in my professional career, start a business. Um, I also kind of going back to me as a younger um, adolescent, I was never the girl or, or person to really fantasize or, or um, um, emphasize on my goals as far as marriage and kids go, you know, like a lot of a lot of women and a lot of people just have these benchmarks they want to reach. Like, you know, when I'm 25, I want to be married. When I'm 30, I want to have one kid, you know, and I didn't have that. And I never really even envisioned what that would look like. It wasn't on my radar. And I, I instead set goals, like I want to make six figures by the time I'm 30, mm. you know, at, at the age of 20, I set that goal. And then I achieved that when I was 26. So I realized, you know, the shift of wealth for me was different because um, I, every job I got hired for, the position was created for me. So I, I think I maybe applied for one job in my whole career, um, that I, I applied to a job posting. And so I started to realize like, well, if I'm creating these roles and these scenarios for other companies and they're listening and hiring me on and making room for me, then why can't I do this on my own? Um, you know, I went through a lot. I, um, I, I had some medical and health crisis is like through, you know, high school and college and even to this day. And it shaped me because, um, it gave me like that fighter mentality and it gave me the strength to kind of persevere through hardships and challenge and struggle. And I'm very aware that no matter what you do, you're going to face that. So I kind of accept and welcome it so I can process, you know, you know, solve it and then move forward. So the goal from, you know, at 26, where do I go from now is, okay, well now I want to make my first mill by, <laughs> um, by the age I'm, I'm 34. So I'm, I'll am i be 31 in June. So hopefully. So you got some time. I have some time, but, but the shift in the wealth for me, isn't the monetary value. It was the recognition of me at 26. I didn't have a millionaire mindset then. And I knew if I needed to get to that benchmark, I needed to do a lot of self-development to be able to get there. So a lot of what I've been working on over the past four years really has been, you know, communication, listening, personal awareness. Um, um, I've been, you know, obsessed with Les Brown and Eric Thompson, you know, because we share that. Oprah, yeah. um, who else? Gary I love Lee, Les Brown. Robbins. Oh my God. I literally can listen to him all the time. Like, yeah, he's day. funny too. You know, I got a question for you. So you mentioned these, uh, you mentioned a lot of these positions as you were coming up in the ranks were created for you on a practical, how, on a practical level. Like how did you like facilitate that to happen? I think that's a really interesting topic for the listener. Like, you know, instead of shooting for a promotion, maybe instead of shooting for a promotion, just, you know, create a new job for yourself within the job that you have. A lot of it is network and relationships. So, um, you know, people, people I've come in contact with in older positions may have led me to the next because they valued what I did. And I went to, you know, I moved on or, or they left and then thought, okay, well, she's a great asset. I want to bring her along with me. So um, it was more so just like my network and not burning any bridges, despite, you know, all of the work politics that happened, you know, in any position and just really, really trying to be um, value add in anything I do. And mm -hmm. so with that, it, I think it offered the opportunity for people to consider me to bring me on. And then from there, it was, you know, the logistics of how do we get this person on board to our team? Yeah, for sure. You learn that at such a young age too, like even like 26, the success that you've had there, like people shoot for that type of success their whole lives, which I think is really interesting. I mean, I know that your parents taught you the value of hard work, but are there any specific lessons that that pop out in your memory that really help like shape that person and that career drive? Totally. Um, so I had I was diagnosed with cervical cancer when I was 18, and I was not very aware of how to process stress 
And so I just kind of put my head down, went through my doctor's appointments, dealt with it, and then moved on. And I was, I was pushing towards, okay, let's just get through this so I can start my life again, basically. And it taught me, it really changed the trajectory of my life at that point, because I, everything I considered from putting into my body to where I spend my time and energy, because, you know, where you, where you seek energy and where you output energy will determine, you know, what results you get. And my energy could have been really negative and it could have been focused on, you know, this really sucks. And, you know, I, I can't believe that I'm so young and I have to deal with this to, I'm a survivor. I'm an athlete. I will not take my body and have not taken my body for granted. Um, but how can I use this to my advantage? And at the time it was, I was working in, um, I was going to school and then I dealt with all of that. And I, um, was in finance. I was, I was at an institutional investment firm in Philadelphia. And I just realized that like, you know, I love numbers. I love, you know, trading and, and deals and all that, but I didn't, find passion and pensions and trust funds and, you know, million dollar accounts that really meant nothing to me. I didn't find passionate. So that was basically when I decided to move to California and I um, kind of changed the industry that I was in to health and wellness, personal mm. beauty. And then I, I also at the same time was competing in figure competitions. So my figure competitions was my outlet for my goal oriented mindset of getting through the um, emotional destruction that I kind of went through and then getting a real tangible result out of it that I'm happy with. Did you say figure competitions? Is yeah, that... it's like a, it's like a low grade of bodybuilding. So there's like different classes in that and hey. there's like bikini model fitness figure. Bodybuilding. Gotcha. It's all making sense now because your Instagram has your six pack and every time I see it, I'm like, how do I do this? <laughs> And first of all, before we, before we go on, I just really want to acknowledge the fact that before this, I've, to, I've told you before that I think you're an absolute genius when it comes to the business, the finance, all of that stuff. Um, and then now just learning of what you had to go through as a teenager with something that's like life threatening and, you know, could potentially be detrimental to your overall health, not just going through that and the strength behind that, but the mindset that it created, the fact that you have both of these things, you're able to, you know, you're Gary v, Gary v fan, right? Like have your head in the clouds um, and really strategize and have a really clear mindset while being really good at the, at the work of the, uh, of the finance aspect of it and the brand building. I, I respect that a lot. It's really incredible to see. And I'm glad that like we've, we were able to do this just so I can learn that about you. I think, I think that's incredible. Yeah. 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 I mean, value is not only just talent, it's, you know, how you go about contributing that value and that's personal relationships and personal development. And if you don't have self-awareness and you don't practice or, or focus on those areas, you know, you're going to be stuck with that, within that mindset that you're trying to break out of, you mm -hmm. know? So, yeah. So that was, that was my effort. I think that's really interesting too, considering your, um, I guess specialties, so to speak, of taking brands from indie to mass, right, is the kind of, I would like to call it a catchphrase, and I think it should be all over the front of your website. But um, there's a lot of that growth mindset that goes into building brands like that, that come from like a personal level and then applied to the companies that these people are starting. But before we get into that a little bit, can you give us, um, you know, maybe one example of a brand that you took from indie to mass? Yeah. Um, and so this was at the transition of me um, creating collective brand group and branching off on my own. Um, you know, I realized it was organic and it was time because I had a book of business sitting on my lap, basically. You know, I had people that I'd been introduced to or networked with um, or recommendations to ask me questions about how to get their brand here, here, and here. What do I do? And then I just started realizing that, like, you know, this is a real need for a lot of people beyond what this own internal organization is, is, is trying to achieve. Um, and then that gave me the, the vote of confidence to go after it. And with that, it was actually a really hard transition because that brand was the brand that, um, that I love to use for this example because it is conge fine jewelry and it's a fine jewelry line. The price points are between 800 to about um, $3,000 per piece. And, um, you know, she was just a digitally native brand. She didn't have much marketing. She had a PR girl, but didn't really have any press or media or coverage to share. 
Um, so I was really carving out that pitch to retailers and um, the, we decided that we would do a broad outreach and we landed on Nordstrom being a good fit. And Nordstrom at the time didn't have a fine jewelry department. So they have, you know, trends and accessories and they have, you know, that, but it's capped at a certain price point because they're very specific on who the Nordstrom gal is. And they rarely try to break that mold to be innovative or bring in something new that doesn't fit that. So, so for them, fine jewelry was new. Um, the brand and the messaging was on target with, with their, you know, demographic and who their market was. It was just a reach. So um, that was an example of really trying to find a place in the market where the channels are limited and the opportunity is limited. You know, there's only so many department stores that will bring in brands at that price point. And then on top of that, you know, making the, bringing demand to the product in the store Wrap, because it's not a name brand, it's not like a recognized label, you know, it's an indie brand. So, so by doing campaigns and using Nordstrom models and um, creating the synergies between retail and that brand um, was, was really the success of, of how she was able to start her retail distribution. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it happened sooner than we thought, but um, I, I feel like that was, it was a hard feat because beauty is kind of like, that's my niche. I've been yeah. in beauty for, for so many years. Um, but it's kind of like, a, it's like a formula. You wash, rinse, repeat. You apply the same um, principles to whatever you're doing, but you make sure that it's fitting and tailored to whatever category your product you're working at. And yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know you deal with a lot of brands that are starting maybe somewhat from the ground level, whether it's, you know, they're looking for their first round of funding or they need clear positioning, things like that. What would you say are the three most overlooked considerations for brands putting together their go to launch strategy or go to market strategy? Totally. So um, number one off the bat is budget. <clears throat> um, you know, the dream of being in retail is, <clears throat> excuse me, the dream of being in retail is we're in retail and we have the exposure, we have the marketing support by this, you know, recognized um, seller, but the actual cost to be there is a blindside because blindsided because a retailer will, will request, if it's beauty products, maybe it's old time, they're requesting 500,000 units. And now this indie brand or this brand that doesn't have, hasn't scaled their business to be able to self fund themselves, got the PO and now they don't know what to do with the PO because they can't pay their manufacturer mm -hmm. or their, you know, their lab to be able to do that. So budget is what number one, um, marketing is another one. Um, as far as like what assets are needed as far as support and operations to a retailer, you know, it's a totally different beast and, um, they're hard, like they'll chew you up alive. So it's the expectations, it's the budget. Um, and it's really just the understanding that whatever you pitch them isn't necessarily what they're going to sell of yours. Mm -hmm. So oversight is, um, is budget 100% budget and what the marketing expense is going to be and what that looks like, the support of working with retailers, um, you know, and, and, really i think that those are the, the three biggest elements that i think most right. indie brands overlook. When, you, when you're working with these indie brands do do they see marketing as a luxury or a necessity yeah so so the the brands that um the indie brands in beauty a lot of them are focusing on social media and um focusing on that digital strategy but other forms of marketing like pr i feel like um, brands and, and brand founders consider that to be a luxury. Um, marketing is expensive. And the catch with that is that investors don't like to see your, you know, use of funds be the bulk of marketing. Mm. I mean, if you're trying to raise capital, they want to see execution, production, purchase orders, innovation. Marketing can be fluff because, you know, you spend it and you don't know what that return of, you know, return on um, investment is right. so yeah yeah that's a real that's a that's a tough catch-22 as well too it's like what good is all of that if you can't get people to notice it but you mm -hmm. mentioned that a lot of brands are looking at you know you actually you mentioned that you can't be loud 
you know, in a crowded arena, that's not necessarily going to work. And I think what's interesting there is the CBD space right now, which I know you have some experience in it too. There's a ton of saturation, not just in CBD, but different industries as well. But what are some ways from your lens that you think people can start to, you know, separate themselves from the competitors or at least be heard in these crowded arenas? Yeah, so there's a really great example um, with a beauty brand specifically. It's not CBD, but it's it's related to my uh, my point. Winky Lux created a product. It was a matcha lip balm, and it was wildly successful. It sold out within like hours, and um, they generated so much revenue just on that one skew. And where they got that skew from wasn't really a fit within their whole assortment. But it was literally developed because of it, matcha was the number one Google search term in that year. Mm. So they created, um, they looked at data and analytics to help guide them on what fast beauty that they were going to produce. So innovation and finding, um, you know, what's trending is relevant. But specifically for CBD, you know, CBD is only one of 113 cannabinoids. So if you want to try and play in CBD, that's the crowded arena. You want to start looking about the, at the other cannabinoids to see what type of innovation um, is there. So as far as what new brands can do that's different, I say research and development is where you start. Analytics and data supports that. And then finding manufacturers that are technically skilled enough to provide not only that's just a quality product, but one that's backed with case studies or um, clinical trials or, or the support that you need. So, so it's an investment um, in CBD. It's a big investment um, just in the cost of new cannabinoids, but um, it's worth it because, you know, you stand out from the rest and now you're setting the trends and becoming, you're demanding becoming the authority in your space. Mm. In one of our conversations, you mentioned the difference between community marketing and um, uh, I believe it was expert marketing. That was the, that, the phrase that you used, but it was specific toward uh, PR. And you've mentioned this a couple of times too, even today where like, you know, everybody's looking at social media as their marketing, which obviously, you know, I believe in and something that needs to be done. But people are underestimating the power of like PR and getting that sort and doing that sort of marketing. Can you explain a little bit about how like how PR can send you uh, separate you from, you know, the rest of the pack? And how does that make you like a leader in that industry when you're using things like PR and traditional media? Yeah, so so Gen Z isn't really interested in um, in influencer collaboration. Last year, we saw a surplus of influencers creating branded products with the company promoting it and it took off for a little bit but it peaked and now it's kind of plateaued where it's not really the new jam you know there's not really you know the that new generation is becoming more savvy and, and want something more authentic um, and so that is a difference from using a generation based off of social media influence and the comparison to beauty editors and industry experts who have back dated in time set the trends and set the tone and, and expectations. So, you know, when you have a write-up from like a reputable publication, like somebody from Hearst, like, you know, or the Caruso group that owns Vanity Fair or, um, you know, Glamour or those types of publications, Allure, um, that you get the Lord's best of stamp on your product, it already validates the performance mm. of it. And so it's, it's a testimonial, it's a community testimonial versus a beauty expert stamp of approval. Yeah, that's heavy. I never really put those, put that together. Um, primarily cause like, I don't put the uh, the magazine and the product together too much. I always just think of like mm. print ads, but then it's like the, well, you mentioned Oprah. She has like an Oprah, the Oprah Winfrey choices of books and stuff. Mm -hmm. Automatic bestseller, right? Crazy how right. that still works. Yeah. So yeah, I'm... go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say in taking these uh, in taking a lot of these brands to like, you know, different investors and getting them prepared uh, to you know, do these big marketing spends, make sure that the production's on point and all of these. What are some of the common traits that of brands that investors are looking at before they actually invest into them? 
Well, first and foremost, investors are people and they're humans. And the human element um, relies heavily on trust. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not just a business transaction of, a, you know, a trade for trade. It's I'm going to put my money in you and I believe in you as a person. So becoming vulnerable is a trait that I think is highly valuable um, and under exercise. Because when you become vulnerable in a situation, you're kind of opening yourself up to be proven wrong or um, be discredited for whatever you're trying to pitch. So if it's a product, you know, you're typically, if you're pitching to raise capital, you're probably talking to an investor that's already done business in that category. You know, whether it's real estate, whether it's consumer packaged goods, whatever food, whatever it may be, they have probably if they're at the point where they can invest in other businesses, seen some major losses and taken some major L's, um, hopefully more wins than others if it's a really good investor you're trying, to, <laughs> trying to work with. But um, they have the wisdom and asking questions is such um, a great way to connect and show qualities of yourself of you're easy to work with, you're easy to communicate with, you have the capacity to grow and to scale and you're learning every day. A lot of times, you know, you see, I've heard and I've seen some mistakes made where you kind of, you come in all confident and strong and that's important too, but um, like no one else knows as much as, as you about this thing, about mm-hmm. this whatever topic or product. And so I think it's important to kind of remain humble a little and, and allow yourself to create that personal connection. Um, so first and foremost, it's not even really about the product. Um, it's about, it's, if it's about the person behind the product and how they can execute. That's interesting. That's actually the second time that I've heard that this week. Um, a recent company I was talking to, Cuevos, I, I asked them, like, what's your secret to uh, Cuevos is like a, a natural uh, a natural chip brand and mm-hmm. i was like what's your secret secret to getting new investors to invest in you and he's like understanding that they're people um and building a real relationship with them because like the financials are the financials but they have to like you it was right. like, <laughs> i think it's such a yeah. big thing <laughs> and also i mean just because you 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 maybe you get some seed funding but you're going to need more money eventually mm-hmm. you know you're going to need to go back to that same person and say okay well we need round two we need you know series d of this production cost to get into this area you know you see it on shark take all the time they're already established businesses um right. and they're pitching themselves but they're doing it to maintain, um, you know, production and to maintain the longevity of the brand. Um, and in some cases, saving their brand from closing. Um, so really becoming that, you know, allowing that insight in is, is really important. So you've, you've had to make some changes potentially in your strategy uh, since you were focused on retailers right and getting these brands into different retailers like Nordstrom's as you mentioned I know that you've gotten some brands into Ultra and some other ones Um, there's a shift obviously going on from taking traditional retail over to e-com and e-tailers what for the brand that hasn't really made that shift for themselves yet what would you recommend they should be prepared with before they present their product to an e-tailer like you know a Nordstrom online or Ulta online something like that Yeah, there's totally, like, there's a lot to do there. And it benefits the brand, whether you disregard brick and mortar, or you want to go and partner with the retailer or not, there's initiatives that you can put in place, you know, like loyalty program, how do you go deeper instead of continuing to get new acquisitions and go wider, Um, building that community, social impact, does your brand have a story that um, you know, like when millennials, 75% of millennials um, choose brands based off of moral compatibility. So mm-hmm. do you have, do you have a social impact strategy that's going to touch your consumers or touch a market that you want to tap into? So it's not always, it's not only about considering who you are today right now, it's who do you want to be and how do you go deeper in that? And understanding, looking at analytics, looking at data, looking at, um, you know, your, your sales history is preparing all that holistically analyzing where you started and then putting in um, initiatives to support that brand story. Because 
that's only just going to be, you know, glorified and it's going to build loyalty for you even stronger when you're in the marketplace because a lot of people will go onto Ulta.com and they'll learn about the brand there, but sometimes, you know, you don't always get the best discounts on those e-tailers and so you might get a better discount on the on the actual e-commerce site of whatever mm. the product is. Um, so that introduction comes back and, you know, if they have, you know, X, Y, and Z and all the box fixed with all those initiatives and it just impacts the loyalty element of going deeper rather than, you know, just getting new acquisitions. Are you, when you, you know, once you get a brand into like an e-tailer, are you, are you supporting these brands as well in like, you know, making sure that they're selling through at these e-tailers and retailers? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah so sorry go ahead no i was gonna say what is what are some of the things that like somebody can do to continue to drive demand to the the e-tailer like let's just say nordstrom.com um, drive demand there without like hurting their bottom line because you know they're losing out a little bit if they're not going straight you know direct to consumer in that spot right yeah so there's a lot that you can do there's um you know quarantine's happening right now so it's how do you drive traffic to those websites and that's the catch that you have to consider you know um when you're going into different retailers it might be this one retailer might be 10 percent of your forecasted revenue for the year but get 10 of those accounts and now you have a half of your pie basically is your own e-commerce site and then your partner retailer so that's the idea of of sending traffic to those retailers is hard because you want to generate the traffic where you make the retail margin rather than make the wholesale margin at a retailer. Um, but you have to understand that it's a long-term play. So in order to get that exposure, you really need to ride that wave out and try to do as much that you can to support that. Um, but what's most important, I think, in, in supporting retailers is, and even getting into retail is understanding that your buyer is a persona and really understanding who you're selling to. Not only that, your buyers have a, the retailer has a persona of who their market, who their demographic is. So mm -hmm. knowing that even further. So collaborations, whether it's brand or influencers, activations, um, pop-ups, things like that can do, can cause and build excitement. Um, and, and online, it's, um, at this point, that's really the only opportunity to, to help drive digital traffic rather than doing, you know, physical activation. Yeah, for sure. Those are some amazing feedback there too, of understanding, like understanding that now it's not just about your brand, but it's also about, and I keep going back to Nordstrom's, but it's about, um, your, not just your brand's persona, but also Nordstrom's brand persona, right? Like how does mm -hmm. it actually fit there? I think not enough people, it's funny how many brands that we've worked with I'm sure you've dealt with the same thing they have some success they look really good on the outside and then you realize that they actually have no idea who they're targeting exactly and that I think goes back to expectation um, so so that's actually where I start with my brands and my and my clients is, is knowing do they have a full brand branding strategy like have they created the branding assets to support anything that they do in the future that they can always go back to and realize this is who we are. Um, so having that first, but then setting the expectations that whatever the product is, and this I mentioned earlier, the expectation to sell whatever you're pitching is not always going to be the case. So um, a lot of times you don't know who you're talking to and you don't have the foresight to be able to provide a solution or come back to them quickly with, with whatever their request is. So, it's, it's almost like a gift. So you bring a gift to a buyer and you have a pretty bow on it. They're going to probably ask you to change the color of the bow. They're probably going to ask you to put it in a new box. They're probably going to try to tell you to take this product out, to put that product in. So the expectation to sell that item on top of whatever the retail price is, a lot of times retail will dictate that too, um, is really the expectation. And so I, I find that managing expectations is also grossly under focused mm -hmm. and should, should be a priority as to setting real forecasts, setting, you know, real lead times and how long development takes, um, understanding that retailers will take six months, you know, out in their planning and um, they're going to maybe tear you down. They love the brand. They love what you're doing, but they're going to try to make it their own. 
Mm. Um, and so that's, that's one way where it's a fine line between, between adapting and always always going with what the retailer says to playing hardball and then taking ownership and control and so that you can really demand the authority space in that situation. I know that I didn't prepare this in the, in the questions that I emailed you before this, but I do, I have a question for you is what, what's a brand that you see right now that's doing really well in the retail space and with e-tailers as well as their own community building and direct to consumer efforts? Uh, that's a great question. In um, in beauty, I would say Glossier 100% is the leader in, um, I mean, they set the tone for all in packaging, basically. Every brand is now adapting to this neutral, you know, feel and vibe. And it's, it's um, they've done an excellent job creating that community base. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I would say Glossier is a really great leader at that. I like that. So collective brand group, you've dealt with, you're dealing with new brands. You're having to make some shifts probably a lot faster than we anticipated with the COVID stuff going from uh, retail to, to e-com more e-com strategies. Uh, What are you, what else are you guys doing to prepare yourself to like work with brands uh, in the future now? Because I I don't think a lot of of the changes that are happening right now are temporary. I think it's actually going to be pretty, more permanent than we think. Agreed. Yeah, totally. And actually, um, I really prefer working with digitally native brands um, mm. that haven't scaled to retail yet because those are the building foundations where you kind of you figure you figured it all out. You pretty much like ironed out all the kinks, and then by the time you get to retail, it's a little bit more um, less damage control that you have to manage. Um, but what Collective Brand Group is doing better is, or is striving to really focus on in the future as we evolve, is um, is really, really offering that digital support so that it's all cohesive and it's a, ho- it's a holistic approach. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's where actually where, like, I would rely on where I am right now, I would rely on you or somebody like you mm. to go in and create that strategy. But having that extension of it in, in the company is, um, is probably something that I, I'll want to evolve to. However, collective brand group is collective. So being an entrepreneur, an independent, um, I value other entrepreneurs and other startups like you. So the collective of other network um, partnerships like you and I or, um, you know, whether it be another PR agency or whatever is having those extensions to make it a collective brand supporting tool. Um, so making sure that that's a highlight in what, in what we pitch is, will be important. Are there any brands that you're working with right now that you're really excited about? Yeah, I am. Um, I'm really excited about a brand called Moxie Lash and it's a magnetic luxury eyeliner and eyelash set. Um, they're, they're so cool and so fun to work with and they really, really listen to the, their talent on the team and they have a very, very intense hiring process, mm. um, which I think is the, is the root of their success is making sure that you have a culture built to be able to support and, you know, get you through anything, but um, they're innovative. They, um, they, they set their expectations Um they're they're adaptable and they're I, I mean I think there's a lot to come from them so I'm excited on some of the projects we're working on but um but no I mean I, I love working with them they love my input in a lot and a lot of things so, so I, I feel like there's a really great bond and partnership that's awesome um Elle, I, I called you Elizabeth in the beginning which was really <laughs> weird for me because I always call you Elle but um if you've shared so much like great stuff with us, there's so much, so many, so much value that we pulled out of this. Now that we've like talked about all the business stuff, the next time that we do this, I really want to get into that millionaire mindset you were talking about. Um, and I think it's, I don't know about, I'm personally not a millionaire yet, uh, but it's something that I'm trying to adapt to. So there definitely has to be a part two of this, but if somebody wants to connect with you, has a brand, has some questions or even wants to work with you, where can they find you? So um, collectivebrandgroup.com is my website and um, L at collectivebrandgroup is my email. Um, 
you know, it's funny because I, I picked my brand, my company up faster than I could even really start it um, by dealing, you know, helping other brands grow. So that's something that I have to actually personally work on as far as my branding goes and social media and getting that, that um, awareness out. But at the time being, um, the website and my email. Uh, perfect. And last question for today. Um, once the uh, COVID-19 you know, quarantine, uh, quarantine mandates are lifted. Who's the first motivational speaker you would want to go see? Um, well, ET obviously. And I think that he, he was doing, wasn't he doing like a tour? Yeah. Center? yeah. Um, I always wanted to go to Tony Robbins, but I'm kind of over that. And yeah. Um, what I really value from him is the, his relationship and his wife, Mel Robbins, mm -hmm. um, her work is, is like now. So, um, Brene Brown, totally. Um, Glennon Doyle, Oprah does their, does her, um, her tour every year. Um, shoot, I'm blanking on the name, but those, but are, those, are, some, people. those are some good ones. I know I'm, I'm kind of bummed. We're halfway planning to go to et until all of it happened i was like damn it that would have been fun but there are master classes now i don't know if you've seen that but there's like you know sessions that you can listen to and it's a subscription but you get people like anna wintour who is like the you know the queen of mm -hmm. beauty and fashion and style and you hear firsthand from her interviews and lessons and sessions so um so I think maybe I'll start with that. I haven't started it yet. I'm starting reading other books, but probably those master classes. I love it. Uh, thank you so much for everything you shared today. I'll, like I said, amazing stuff that you put in here. And I think all of, it, all of us can really learn from everything that you shared with us. Uh, to the listener, thank you so much for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. If you love the episode, we would dig a five-star review. And if you didn't like it that much, feel free to stick it to us, but subscribe anyway, because we're going to have a ton of incredible people just like Elle back on the show. Thanks again. Thanks, Meg.